This is an R35 Nissan GTR. Now, if you're thinking about buying one of these, you've clicked on the right video because I'm gonna comprehensively take you through everything that you need to know. We'll get it out on the road, we'll get the car up on a ramp, and we'll walk around it and show you everything that you need to check. Let's go. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, haven't you already covered the R35 GTR buyer's guide? And the answer to that is yes, but consider this video your more comprehensive, deeper dive insight into buying one of these cars. We're gonna get it on the ramp, as I say, we're gonna remove under trays, we're really gonna get into the guts of things to show you exactly what goes wrong. So grab a brew, this is gonna be a good one. So let's kick off on the engine front, shall we? Now, thankfully, these tend to be really quite robust. Now, the main thing to bear in mind is the vast majority of GTRs that you go and look at, if not all of them, will have some form of modification done to them. Finding a standard one of these cars nowadays is a bit of a unicorn. Now, for the uninitiated amongst us, let's just quickly recap on what those modifications are likely to be. So these GTRs tend to be modified in stages. Stage one is just a remap and one piece of the exhaust system known as the Y pipe that gets changed out. I'll show you that once we got the car up on the ramp. Stage two adds in the rest of the exhaust. The back box can be a bit restrictive on these. Stage three adds in the big cone filters that you get behind the bumper. Stage four is the bigger injectors, usually 1100 cc. And stage 4.25, which this car is, adds in either the sport cat or the D-cat downpipes as well. <laughs> I'm gonna get hit with a cyclist doing this. Guy's on a scooter now. Now in terms of reliability, at any of those stages, chances are you're gonna be okay. They're pretty safe. The big thing to be mindful of here is making sure that the tuner who's carried out the work on the car that you're looking to buy is reputable. There are a handful of reputable tuners here left in the UK and there's a handful of cowboys as well. So do your homework, make sure it's been a reputable tuner who's carried out that work. Now, probably the most common failure that you're likely to read about or see with regard to a tuned GTR is to do with the rods being bent. Now, I want to say right off the bat, this is not a common failure. You usually tend to find it in cars that have had a lot of track time, maybe have a really torque heavy map or been driven like they've been stolen every day of their life for the last five years or whatever. Now, it's not something to be overly concerned about, something to be mindful of that on a tuned GTR, rods are probably the weakest link. Unfortunately, there's no real way of checking them because it's not until you go to build the engine, you take them out and they're like bananas. So I think right about now is a good point to pause and talk about the different generations of GTR that you're gonna find on the used market. The very earliest R35s are the CBAs. These are from 2008, 2009. Now the DBA came along in 2011, took the CBA's place. Then in 2016, same thing happened again. The EBA took the DBA's place. Now thankfully, they're quite easy to tell apart. DBA introduced the DRLs and then EBA is a completely different design altogether. So a question that I'm quite often asked is which year of GTR should I buy? And my answer never changes, and that is to buy the newest GTR that you can afford. Seems a bit obvious, but on the GTR, it's really, really relevant because although we had the big phase changes from CBA to DBA to EBA, and we'll talk about some of those changes as we go through this video, year on year, there was also incremental improvements to the cars. So really, just buy the newest example that you can get your hands on. Now, regardless of the year of GTR that you're thinking about buying, one thing that you may see on it is, oh, there's a B there. It's to do with the headlights. We'll just let that B chill. <laughs> now, what tends to happen, especially if the car's just been washed, is the water will get in and you'll see the moisture on the inside of the unit. Now, it doesn't seem to cause any problems to the unit itself, just doesn't look the best. Now, another thing to be wary of, especially those of you who are maybe thinking about buying an earlier GTR, one of the CBA cars, especially if it's low mileage as well, be wary of the brake discs. Now a problem with these way back then was to do with the discs cracking between the holes. It was really common on cars if the brakes had seen some heavy use. Now the DBA onwards, it was less common because they actually fitted bigger discs to those cars. 
Now, just in case any of you are tempted to click off of this video early, one little thing to add when I say just buy the newest GTR that you can afford, and that is try and get your hands on a 2011 onwards DBA car, ideally mainly because of the changes that were made in the gearbox. Now we'll talk about these in more detail once we get the car up on a ramp and I can show you things a little bit better. Now one other thing to mention, regardless of the year of GTR that you're buying, one thing to check and that is for corrosion underneath these mirrors here tends to congregate just about here now, there was some theory that it was due to the mirrors flexion as you're driving along more higher speed stuff the mirrors flex slightly and the moisture can start to get in underneath the paint as to whether that's true i don't know but it's definitely the case that they can rust sorry not rust corrode round about here i corrected myself there because these doors are not steel they're aluminium so technically it's corrosion it's not rust the other common spot that you'll find rust is on the boot lid so double check around about the boot lid as well again it's not necessarily a deal breaker but it's certainly something that you can bring up with that seller bring into the negotiation hopefully save yourself a little bit of money that was another thing that changed from dba onwards by the way was to do with the way in which the lacquer was applied to these cars a lot of early customers complained about stone chipping on the front of the car so nissan did do something with the lacquer to make it a bit more robust so you'll find that the dba paint is a bit less prone to stone chips and such so on the interior, definitely a couple of things you want to check in here. But before we get to it, quick favor to ask you guys, and I'll make this fast. If you're getting value from this, please do hit that like button so that others can find it as well. And also, we create these buyer's guides for every type of car. GTRs, Ford Focuses, Lamborghini Aventadors, you name it. We've got a guide for buying them secondhand. So this channel may well be a worthwhile subscribe for you as well. Anyway, onto the interior. So one of the first things, especially on those early CBA cars, they used a much lower resolution multifunction display here in the center, and it could sometimes start to fail. So look out for any flickering, anything going on with that screen. It should just stay pretty consistent the whole time that you're on that test drive. Now, the other thing that these GTRs got, almost every GTR, apart from the very earliest CBAs, got the Bose sound system. Now the door speakers can sometimes start to rattle and blow, so make sure that's not the case. Get the tunes pumped up on that test drive. And something else that was quite common for failing, again, more so on the earlier cars, was this instrument cluster in front of you. It's backlit with little LEDs on a board. Those LEDs could start to fail one by one, and when they would, you'd end up with an instrument cluster half in darkness. Kind of hard to spot on a really summery day like we've got here, but if you can get into a garage, maybe a multi-story car park or something like that, turn the lights on and it all should light up nicely. Now, if you're really serious about buying one of these GTRs, one thing I definitely recommend that you buy up front, even before you get the car, is one of these little Ecutech dongles. Now, this isn't an affiliation. I'm not paid by these guys or anything. This is just genuine advice. It's something that I wish I'd known before I went off and bought this car because you plug that in and you can tell a heck of a lot of information about that car. You can tell how many times it's been launched. You can tell what temperatures the gearbox has been to. You can tell any warnings that the car has had and logged. And also, it's really helpful now when you're looking to buy a car, but when you've actually got the car, it's also good to keep tabs on all this stuff and you can also use it for doing clutch learns and such as well. If you want to know a bit more about it, drop a comment below. So usually underneath here, we'd have a load of under trays, but we've got them all off for you, give you a proper look at this today. So first up, we'll work away from the rear to the front of the car, and I'll just talk about the different items as we go. First up, rear subframes. Really, really common, harsh Scottish or even UK winters, puts a bit of rust on these. This is absolutely fine, bit of surface rust, don't worry about that. It's when it becomes structural that's an issue. Thankfully, there are a few nice options out there, aftermarket, tubular ones, that also offer a bit of weight saving as well. So this can be resolved quite quick and easy if it does start to rust bad. So moving forward here, we've got the gearbox. Now, as I'd mentioned earlier in this video, it changed quite a bit from the CBA cars to the DBA cars. Now, one of the things that changed inside the gearbox here was the design of the synchro sleeves. 
Now, on the CBA cars, what you had basically were these little stops on that synchro sleeve. And as the gear would engage, it stopped it engaging too far. Now, they were really quite short and stubby on those CBA cars, and eventually they would go brittle and they can sometimes be hit off. Now, what that done was two things. Number one, it would cause the gear to engage a bit too far, but number two, you would then have these little heat-treated, hardened pieces of steel floating about in your gearbox, and you can just imagine the kind of damage that would do. On these, the DBA and forward cars, those little stops got a fair bit longer and stronger. Now, it sometimes can still occur, but it's much, much rarer. So another interesting change that was made between the CBAs and the DBA forward cars were the clutch seals. Now, I say this is interesting because although the parts look identical, obviously something must have changed. That could have been the manufacturing process or the type of material that was made from. However, what you find is that those earlier CBA cars were much more likely to blow out a clutch seal and leave the car stranded in gear. So the final change to mention between those CBA early cars and the later DBA onwards cars was to do with the way in which the gearbox sent power through this front prop shaft to the front differential. Now, the way in which it works is you've essentially got a little set of gears here that goes on a spline shaft, and as that all turns, that's what's going to send the power to the front. Now, the problem was, again, on those early CBA cars, the splines on that shaft were really quite short, and again, they could be brittle. And it was the shock, it was always to do with the shock, it wasn't just a constant loading. As these got shocked time and time again, one by one, it would pop those splines off the shaft, until the gear was no longer held in place and it could exit over the shaft. What then happened, or I should say the problem is, the driver wouldn't necessarily know that this has happened. He wouldn't feel or hear anything, but that gear that's now popped off tends to grind up on other stuff inside the gearbox and you end up with this horrible metallic paste throughout. If you take the cover off the gearbox and you see that that gear has been moved, then you're in a whole world of hurt. And again, it got a lot better on the DBA cars. This problem didn't tend to happen because those splines, again, were quite a bit longer and stronger. And it's just another reason why you maybe want to consider going for a 2011 onwards GTR. Something else to mention on the gearbox front is this sump here. So the standard Nissan one is made from mild steel. It does have a coating on it, but give that about 10 years, the coating comes off, starts to corrode, goes porous and begins leaking. So as I say, you'll probably get about 10 years service out of the original sump. Then you maybe want to upgrade to like this car's got a billet sump or just put another Nissan one on. Either way, just make sure there's no oil underneath the car at the rear. A lot of people forget the gearbox is at the back and just look under the front for oil leaks. So final thing to talk about whilst we're under here is something you've no doubt heard about if you've been looking to buy a GTR for any time. And that is the infamous bell housing problems. Now, the bell housing itself, it sits just under this tray here, and yeah, first thing I'll say, they all rattle. I'll let you hear this car when we get it out on the road in a few minutes. This is deemed to be pretty quiet, pretty reasonable. If the one you're looking at sounds like this, I'd personally say it's fine. Some of them do rattle really bad, though, and obviously, they need swapped out. Some of the GTR specialists in the UK will fit uprated ones for you, maybe last a little bit longer, but they all start to rattle eventually, unfortunately. So what the bell housing actually is, is essentially a set of bearings onto the main prop shaft. Now, obviously, we've got the engine up front, we've got the gearbox at the back. These two big heavy objects are moving about independently, and that prop shaft sits in the middle, just beating the absolute shit out of the bell housing, essentially. So it'll wear out the bearings, or it'll wear out where the bearings are fitted in the bell housing, if it's an earlier one. Later bell housings had steel inserts, so it wouldn't wear out the bell housing itself, but then the bearings started to go bad. So it'll either be the bearings or it could be the bell housing itself, essentially. Final thing to mention, not strictly under the car, but hanging off the front of the car here, we've got the two standard intercoolers. Now, as GTRs get older, the metal starts to corrode, and yes, these can be quite common for splitting. Thankfully, from a purchasing point of view, the car's gonna run pretty badly, so it'd be hard to miss, and it's a really good opportunity and excuse to upgrade to a nice big race intercooler. So, first up, 
I think we've picked the hottest day in Scotland ever to do this. It's a million degrees in here. So let's make this swift and I'll get the aircon going for my own good. Now, first things first, hit that start button and allow it to come fully on ignition. What we're listening for here is a clicking that comes from the back left-hand corner. Now, if you hear that clicking, what that indicates is that you're sat in a GTR that's got a factory tracker fitted. Could be aftermarket as well, I guess, but the factory ones definitely click. I've heard tons of them. Now, why I bring this up is because that tracker will have two tracker fobs supplied with it. Now, make sure you get them from the seller because even if he tells you that it's been disabled, it's not worked for 10 years or whatever, you still need those tracker fobs because sometimes it needs a bit of a reset. You need to press the button on the tracker to get it to communicate with the car. Otherwise, you're stranded. The car won't start. So make sure you get both of those tracker fobs. Next up, we spoke about the bell housing, obviously. As I said, I'm gonna let you hear it on this car. Now, one thing to bear in mind as well, actually, is I think stage four or stage 4.25 kind of exacerbates the bell housing noise because it's got a lumpier idle. I think it does anyway. But as you can hear from the inside, can't really hear much at all. And if I take the camera out, let me show you from the outside as well. So yeah, fairly quiet. Really, it's only a massive problem if it sounds like a ton of dinner plates rattling about really badly. Now the next thing we want to do here before we set off, first thing to mention actually, this car is warmed up. This is my own car, I'm, I'm not looking to buy it again. But hopefully the car you're looking at, if you can arrange it with the seller to have the car cold for you arriving, that's ideal. Because here's what we want to do. We want to take the gear stick, pop it into drive, and make sure it goes into first gear. From there, go to reverse, make sure it selects reverse cleanly, make sure the reverse camera comes on, back to drive. Back to reverse, back to drive. Do this a couple of times, and each time you do this, it should never flash the number one at you like that, and it should never jump straight to second gear either. If it's doing either of those two things, problem in the gearbox, run a mile. So as you get on the move with the car that you're looking at, first things first, just get it into drive, get rolling and make sure there's no untoward noises. Some of the clutches on the CBA cars can be really quite noisy as well as you set off. Not indicative of a problem as such, but uh, some do it, some don't. Uh, personally, I'd rather buy one that doesn't have a lot of clutch noise as you take away. So be on the lookout for that. And now that we're moving as well, just be paying attention to everything. I know you got a lot on your plate here, but be paying attention to how is it changing gear? How is it sounding? Does the power feel really jerky? Even with these big injectors and in, it shouldn't feel jerky. Just overall, how is the car feeling? What's it saying to you? This is also a good opportunity to start having a bit of a play with some of the electrics. Now, there's no notorious problems when it comes to the electrics and GTRs, but just the usual stuff that you would do with any car, make sure that aircon's blowing cold, make sure the radio works, listen to those speakers, we already spoke about that problem, and just make sure it all seems okay. Now, although there's a lot of chat as well about these gearboxes being quite noisy and quite uncouth, one thing I would say is they are actually very smooth. So if you're driving a car and you're feeling like it's going into gear really jerky or violently, something's not right there. I'll slow right down for you here. This is me in auto. I'll just give it a bit of throttle. And you can hear there's no crunching, there's no jerking as you're going through those gears. And that's the way it should be. And again, even on these early CBA cars, it's the way it should be as well. It's all pretty smooth. Now, something else to check. Make sure the car's using all six forward gears. It shouldn't be flashing that display gear icon at you at any point. It shouldn't hesitate going into any gear at any point. When it's just in drive, it will drive like a normal car. Maybe a bit more transmission and gearbox noise than you're used to, but other than that, it should feel fairly normal. Don't let any seller tell you otherwise. Now, obviously, once it's up to temperature, you need to give it a bit of a blast. Would be rude not to. <laughs> My God. Yeah, and even a stock GTR, 
there's something wrong if it's not blowing your mind performance wise. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, so it should feel fast. It should certainly feel fast. And also, while you're on that throttle, maybe you could get a friend to do this for you, but have him or her look out the back window and make sure the car's not blowing excessive amounts of black smoke or any blue smoke whatsoever. Now, as for the final thing for you to do, I'm gonna try and demonstrate here. We've got a little quiet car park. Now, what you want to do is hard lock and start maneuvering around and pay attention to how the wheels are moving. What's normal is a bit of wheel hop, a bit of judder from the rear. That's pretty normal. A lot of GTRs do that, including this one right now. But from the front, we shouldn't have anything like that. You shouldn't have any wheel hop. The wheels shouldn't be skipping. That would indicate that there's maybe a problem with the front diff. And there you have it. You now have all the tips you need to go off and find yourself a brilliant R35 Nissan GTR. But don't click off of this video just yet. Hang around and see how it scores on a reliability leaderboard. So the R35 Nissan GTR, how do we score it on a reliability leaderboard? Now, I think this is important because although there's a ton of GTR content out there, I think most of it from this perspective are when the cars were pretty new. So what we're saying here is how does it fare reliability wise 12, 13 years on from when it was first brought here to the UK? And I'm glad to say, given the performance category that this thing operates in, it is supremely reliable. And for that reason, we award it a very, very respectable 8.5 out of 10. Now, thank you so much for watching. Please do hit that subscribe button and we'll see you next time.